Hello everybody, just before we get started, I will say that this is not a normal biographics video. We don't normally put out content on a Friday, so this is just a bit of extra bonus stuff for you. This video on Neil Armstrong was actually one I did for another channel I do called Highlight History. I'm linking to that below if you like this and would like to check out more. The whole video is here, so I'm not going to stop it halfway through and say you have to go over to the other channel and watch the rest. The whole video is here, so you can enjoy it in its fullness, and if you really like it, do please go subscribe subscribe to highlight history that would be fantastic it's all of a today in history thing that i do and let's get into it After undergoing cardiac bypass surgery in August of 2012, Neil Armstrong seemed to be recovering just fine, at which point, reportedly, some of his nurses removed wires that had been temporarily attached to his pacemaker. What followed was internal bleeding, which in turn led doctors to drain the blood instead of choosing to operate to stop the bleeding. Ultimately, he died. Today in history, August the 25th, 2012, at the age of 82. What followed was a legal battle that eventually saw the hospital threatened with having the details of the lawsuit publicized if they didn't pay a settlement. The hospital then gave in, with some among Armstrong's family receiving portions of a $6 million settlement for alleged malpractice on the part of the hospital workers. The details of what exactly occurred in Armstrong's last days have largely been kept out of the public eye, owing to a non-disclosure agreement as a stipulation of the settlement. That said, Armstrong's wife, Carol, was very public about her opposition of the lawsuit in the first place, noting Neil would not have approved of it, with Carol further saying in an interview, I wasn't part of it, I want that for the record. Whatever happens exactly, after Armstrong's death, then-President Obama stated, Neil was among the greatest of American heroes, not just of his time, but of all time. When he and his fellow crew members lifted off aboard Apollo 11 in 1969, they carried with them the aspirations of an entire nation. They set out to show the world that the American spirit can see beyond what seems unimaginable, that with enough drive and ingenuity, anything is possible. And when Neil stepped foot on the surface of the moon for the first time, he delivered a moment of human achievement that will never be forgotten. So, how did Neil Armstrong come to be one of the most legendary explorers in human history? Well, funnily enough, it all started with his late application being clandestinely slipped into the application pile when it technically should never have been. You see, Armstrong turned his application into NASA about a week after the 1st of June 1962 deadline, making him ineligible for that historic second round of astronaut hirings. Luckily for Armstrong, Dick Day, who was the one to encourage Armstrong to apply in the first place and was working at NASA as an assistant head of flight crew operations, clandestinely slipped Armstrong's application into the candidate resume folders before the applications were reviewed by the selection panel. Said Day, I really didn't know why Neil delayed his application, but he did, and all the applications came to me since I was the head of flight crew training. But he had done so many things so well at Edwards. He was so far and away the best qualified, more than any other, certainly as compared to the first group of astronauts. We, that's Day and Walt Williams, wanted him in. It has been speculated since, whether accurately or not as anyone's guess, that the lateness of the application may have had something to do with Armstrong's two-year-old daughter, Karen, tragically dying just a few months earlier from complications due to a tumor that was growing on her brainstem. Whatever the case, as for his qualifications, Armstrong had been a pilot since 16 years old and ultimately flew a whopping 78 combat missions during the Korean War. In one mission, he had part of a wing sheared off by a cable booby trap about 500 feet above the ground, all while under heavy fire. He managed to keep the plane in the air long enough to get away, but eventually he had to eject, at which point he was rescued by a fellow Navy flyer in a jeep, funnily enough. During college, beyond writing and directing two musicals on the side, he earned both a Bachelor's of Science in Aeronautical Engineering and later a Master's of Science in Aerospace Engineering. He followed all of that up by becoming a test pilot, flying over 200 different aircraft models, including the rocket-powered variety, in the process quickly becoming considered one of the top pilots in the world. Out of a group of 29 astronauts that trained for the Apollo mission to the moon, only three were chosen for the first planned moon landing when the final announcement was made in January of 1969. Neil Armstrong, Edwin Buzz Aldrin and the oft-forgotten Michael Collins became the official crew of Apollo 11. Immediately, attention turned to which crew member, Armstrong or Aldrin, would be the first to walk on the moon. Collins was the command module pilot, and therefore he was ineligible. Even though both men were going to walk on the moon, it was a great honor to be the first. In fact, this question was asked at that press conference, and the response was that it had yet to be decided. Over the next four months, as the astronauts continued their training, debate and rumors circulated among the media. 
At first, it seems like Aldrin would have the honor. This speculation came from the precedent set by the Gemini program, which made 10 crewed flights for the purpose of testing ships and astronauts to spacewalk. During the flights, the commander, which Armstrong was to be for Apollo 11, stayed inside the ship, while the pilot, which Aldrin was to be on Apollo 11, did the spacewalking. Further fueling this thinking was that it was rumored that Aldrin was actively campaigning to be the guy. According to the memoir written by Chris Kraft, head of Mission Control, Buzz Aldrin desperately wanted that honor and wasn't quiet in letting it be known. In April, only three months before liftoff, it was announced that Neil Armstrong would be the first man to walk on the moon. The main reason that NASA gave for this decision was that the Eagle's hatch opened to one side rather than up and down, and that side was towards the pilot, Aldrin. The bottom line was that when the hatch was opened, the commander, Armstrong, had a clear path to exit, while the pilot was pinned in the rather cramped space of the module. By sheer happenstance, it made more sense for Armstrong to exit first. Plus, as NASA's heads pointed out, Armstrong was actually the more senior member of the team anyway, having entered the program in 1962, while Aldrin joined in 1963. In later years, despite the official Hatch story, some, including Kraft and fellow astronaut Al Bean, have come out and said that NASA wanted Armstrong to have this honor rather than Aldrin because they thought Neil's ego could handle it better than Aldrin's. It's therefore speculated that maybe the Hatch design was just the excuse that NASA was looking for. Whatever the case, when he stepped out onto the moon, Armstrong spoke some of the most famous words in the history of mankind. That's one small step for man. So true, so brilliant, so inspirational, yet so contradictory. I mean, the word man and mankind are used synonymously, meaning that the oh-so-famous quote, quite simply put, was, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for man, which makes no sense. So, well, what is going on here, Neil? A one-lettered, indefinite article is all it would take to turn this quote into the inspirational words our brains all process when we hear them. And that article is a. One small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. That is how most people interpret his words, and according to Neil Armstrong, those are the words that he intended to speak. NASA's official transcript of the quote still shows the A in parentheses. That's one small step for A in parentheses, man, one giant leap for mankind. This is because the A is not audible in the broadcast. For years, both NASA and Armstrong insisted that static had obscured the A. Armstrong himself stated that he would never make such a mistake, omitting such an important part, but after listening to recordings of his quote, he finally conceded that it's possible he may not have said the A. When he admitted this, he stated, I would hope that history would grant me leeway for dropping the syllable and understand that it was certainly intended, even if it was not said, although it might actually have been. An Australian-based computer programmer named Peter Shanford conducted an audio analysis to support Armstrong's claim that he did say A and concluded that he did, in fact, say A man, but, but the A was inaudible due to technological limitations of the time. However, linguists David Beaver and Mark Lieberman wrote their own digital audio analysis of the infamous quote on their language log blog and concluded that the acoustic evidence seems to be against Ford's theory. But that's not the end of the story. Support for Armstrong has been found by a team of researchers from Michigan State University and Ohio State University who have concluded that Armstrong did indeed speak the words he claims to have spoken, but static or technological limitations are not to blame for its apparent omission. According to them, it's Armstrong's Ohioan accent that's to blame. According to a Michigan State University specialist in communicative sciences, assistant professor Laura Diller, because of the dialect of his hometown, if Neil Armstrong's voice did use the word A, it was short and fully acoustically blended with the preceding word for. The Acoustical Society of America's article on this topic states that Dilly and her colleagues, who include MSU linguist Melissa Bayes Burke and OSU psychologist Mark Pitt, thought they might be able to figure out what Armstrong said with a statistical analysis of the duration of the R sound as spoken by native Central Ohioans saying for and for a in natural conversation. They used a collection of recordings of conversational speech from 40 people raised in Columbus, Ohio, near Armstrong's native town of Wapakoneta. Within this body of recordings, they found 191 cases of 4A. They matched each of these to an instance of 4, as said by the same speaker, and compared the relative duration. They also examined the duration of Armstrong's 4A from the lunar transmission. The researchers found a large overlap between the relative duration of the R sounds in 4 and 4A 
A using the Ohio speech data. The duration of the fra in Armstrong's recording was 0.127 seconds, which falls into the middle of this overlap, though it is a slightly better match for an A less 4. In other words, the researchers conclude the lunar landing quote is highly compatible with either possible interpretation, though it is probably slightly more likely to be perceived as 4, regardless of what Armstrong actually said. Dilly says there may have been a perfect storm of conditions for the word A to have been spoken, but not heard. This all might have you wondering if Armstrong had previously planned his famous line, or if it came to him while he was sitting on the moon. Even until his last breath in 2012, Armstrong adamantly insisted that his first line was spontaneous and was only settled on in the moments prior to the walk. A BBC documentary released after the astronaut's death disputes this, though. In the film, Dean Armstrong, Neil's brother, tells the story of a note passed during a late-night game of Risk. Nobody can say that astronauts don't know how to party, but seriously, though, one dude definitely did if you want to learn more about him check out our video Don Draper in a spacesuit on our Today I Found Out channel for more on that. Anyway, in the months leading up to the mission, Dean, Neil, and their family spent time together at Cape Cod. After both men put their boys to bed, Neil challenged his younger brother to a hearty game of risk. During that game, Neil handed Dean a piece of paper. On that piece of paper, there was, that's one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. He says, what do you think about that? I said, fabulous. He said, I thought you might like that but I wanted you to read it. That said, both Aldrin and Collins made it clear that at no point did Armstrong share his thoughts on what he would say with them. Of course, perhaps his brother was the exception. Although given the second thing he said on the moon was far less eloquent, seemingly there was at least some prep. As for that second thing, according to the official Apollo 11 air-to-ground voice transcription, it was, and the surface is fine and powdery. Armstrong continued on this line of thinking, I can pick it up loosely with my toe. It does adhere in fine layers like powdered charcoal to the sole and sides of my boots. I only go in a small fraction of an inch, maybe an eighth of an inch. But I can see the footprints of my boots and the treads in the fine sandy particles. After coming back from the moon and spending a couple of weeks in quarantine to make sure that he had not picked up any alien cooties, Armstrong then went on a major publicity tour promoting NASA and the Blizzard People agenda, serving as the Deputy Associate Administrator for Aeronautics for the Office of Advanced Research and Technology, and then, not long after that, in 1971, he left NASA. From there, Armstrong lived a mostly quiet life, said John Glenn of this. Armstrong doesn't feel that he should be out huckstering himself. He was a humble person, and that's the way he remains after his lunar flight, as well as before. Beyond keeping a mostly low profile, he, among other things, taught aerospace engineering at the University of Cincinnati, helped investigate spaceflight accidents, and acted as a spokesman and or board member for various businesses. Ever the Explorer, in 1985, Armstrong went on a little trip with Edmund Hillary, the first person, along with Tenzing Norgay, to summit Mount Everest, Steve Fawcett, first person to fly around the world non-stop, doing it in a balloon and separately in an airplane, and Patrick Morrow, the first person to summit each of the tallest mountains in Asia, Africa, North America, South America, Antarctica, Europe, and Australia. So what did this illustrious group of explorers do together? Well, they took a jaunt to the North Pole, presumably using Armstrong's connections with NASA to get access, given NASA closely guards the giant icy wall there, keeping it from the public eye, in order to maintain the deception that the Earth isn't flat as is plain as day to anyone with eyes. For more on this, go see our video on our sister channel today I found out why do people think the Earth is flat? And now for some bonus facts. When Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin stepped out onto the moon all those years ago, literally everything they did became a record because everything they did that day was the first time in human history someone had done something on the moon. For example, after Aldrin joined Armstrong on the surface of the moon, the pair became the first to hop like a kangaroo on the moon for science. Now you see, NASA wasn't entirely sure about how astronauts should move around on the moon since they could only theorize about how lower gravity would affect their movement and balance. As such, the pair were asked to experiment with different ways of moving to discern the most efficient method of getting from point A to point B for future astronauts. Initially, NASA had assumed that the best way to move around on the moon would be to use small, double-footed jumps not unlike a kangaroo. However, Aldrin and Armstrong found this way of moving awkward and unnatural, and both astronauts found it easy to move in a much more conventional manner, hopping from one foot to the other. Armstrong nicknamed this way of moving the loop. As for the first meal on the moon, this consisted of bacon, cookies, and coffee, along with some peaches and a glass of grapefruit juice. If you hoped the bacon part of the meal was the first item eaten on the moon, well, we're sorry to disappoint you. 
Contrary to what you'll often read, a very small something was eaten shortly before the meal, and that was communion bread eaten by Buzz Aldrin shortly after landing on the surface. Before Aldrin set off on the Apollo 11 mission, he took with him a small communion kit given to him by Reverend Dean Woodruff so that he could symbolically take part in the ceremony with the other members of his Presbyterian church. This kit contained a small piece of communion bread and a small vial of wine, both of which Aldrin consumed after saying a prayer during the Apollo 11 radio blackout. This was also, unsurprisingly, the first religious service held on the moon. Aldrin had initially planned to share his communion prayer with the people of Earth, but NASA requested at the last minute that he not do this in order to avoid offending people not of the Christian faith, as it happened when the crew of Apollo 8 had read a passage from Genesis. Aldrin agreed and instead performed the ceremony privately, while Armstrong respectfully observed. Buzz Aldrin also took another first away from Neil, and that was being the first person to urinate on the moon. So, well, take that, Mr. Armstrong. And if you're thinking just now that this isn't nearly as brave as being the first person to step out onto the moon and into the black void of space, you should probably know that the urine collection system on the lunar module had to be pressurized. To ensure that the astronauts weren't injured while peeing, it was noted in the Apollo Experience report that a prime urine transfer design constraint for the lunar module was that the crewmen would be protected at all times from pressure differentials. This system, however, was a little buggy at first. NASA engineers being NASA engineers, they worked out all the kinks in the end. But let's not discount the bravery of being the first man to use the extreme suction device on the LEM. And now for another bonus fact. Speaking of Buzz, Aldrin's mother's name before getting married was Marion Moon. As for his nickname Buzz, Edwin Eugene Aldrin got that name due to one of his older sisters. This was Faye Ann Aldrin mispronouncing brother as Buzzer. She was a year and a half old when Buzz was born. Rather than call him Junior or the like, his father's name was also Edwin Eugene Aldrin, Buzzer was shortened to Buzz and became his chosen moniker for the rest of his life. In 1988, Aldrin even made it official by legally changing his name. Hi again, Simon here. If you enjoyed this this video, please do consider going and subscribing to Highlight History, where this video originally aired. If you liked it, there is a link in the description below. And thank you for watching.